Hey folks, uh, this is my uh, second attempt at a little lecture uh, recording. Uh, I moved into a room where I'll be able to switch back and forth between the screens because there's some things I want to be able to show you uh, directly. Uh, it's on the uh, Blackboard page, our course page. Uh, and I also want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the basic ideas of romanticism, uh, which will apply really for the next five weeks of the course. Uh, before I do that, though, I want to uh, just kind of run over the uh, basic links that are on the course and where you will find things. Um, so I'm going to shift over to the computer so you can see what I'm looking at. And this is what your course page will look like, the home page. Uh, it's got my announcements if I need to uh, uh, post something quickly or uh, maybe even not so quickly, but something I want you to think about or look at or do um, uh, that isn't listed elsewhere, I'll, I'll post it on announcements and probably send you an email. Uh, here's the course menu. Again, the course calendar will show uh, uh, due dates for assignments. Uh, you can also take a look at the syllabus, which I'll do here in just a second. Uh, on your screen, it will show your course grade, so as you complete assignments and those assignments go into the grade book, uh, there'll be a running total uh, for uh, the entire semester. Uh, once uh, Some of the uh, assignments will be graded fairly quickly, some will take a little bit longer uh, depending on the length of the assignment, but you can always keep track of what your course grade is uh, by clicking on this link. Uh, I, I mentioned a little bit on the, the first the welcome video that I did about uh, communications and about email, and uh, there's the class announcements, and that's essentially what's up here. So. Uh, what I want to I want to point out these two things: uh, the email email external I don't use, uh, and uh, you shouldn't use it either. Uh, this is the internal in course only, which means that if you send me an email or I send you an email, it's only going to be uh, within the Blackboard system, um, and that's fine if you want to use that to contact me. If it's something more immediate. Uh, you should use my office email because I don't get notification of emails to Blackboard, but I do get notifications of emails to my office email. So again, there are really two email systems you can use and we will use to communicate. One is my office email, which is included in a, uh, listed on the syllabus, and the other is uh, the internal to the in-course only to Blackboard. Uh, course content, this is a very important section because it's in the course content that you'll find uh, detailed schedules, I'll look at that in just a second, uh, reading journal assignments, and also some web resources, which will, the web resources will include the videos that I uh, make for the class as well. I want to go back to the syllabus real quick and show you a few things. <clears throat> and again, I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, and read it to you, but I do want to point out some places you'll find some information that's useful. Contact information, of course, is very important. Uh, this is my email address. When I talk about my office email, this is my office email address. These are the office hours I have established uh, at this point. Um, again, most of you, uh, or many of you may be off-site uh, and wouldn't be able to visit me during office hours anyway, but you can always contact me uh, by email. Uh, I do want you to read through the course objectives, they're very broad, but it gives you some idea about what we're aiming at this semester. And uh, I mentioned in my welcome video as well that you need to make sure that you get your books. And this is the book that you need to have. As I said, it's actually a collection of three volumes. It's a three volume set. 2A, 2B, and 2C. We'll be working with 2A to start with. Uh, but this is the basic information you need, uh, ISBN number, the publisher, the fifth edition. One of the things that you might notice when you do get the books is that two of the volumes are actually listed as the fourth edition and one volume is the fifth edition. That's a little bit confusing, but they all should come together and uh, uh, as long as you get the right ISBN number if you're ordering from somewhere other than uh, the NOC bookstore, uh, just make sure all this information matches up when you order from an external uh, entity like Amazon or however you manage to get your books. Uh, there's some stuff on here, again, I'm going to let you go through uh, on your own, but certainly it's important that you keep up with assignments and adhere to the uh, due dates, the announced due dates in the class. Um, 
again, I, I don't plan out the entire semester from the very beginning. Uh, so I do a schedule of five weeks, five weeks, and five weeks. So you have to make sure that you are uh, paying attention to what's going on in class so you know when things are due. Again, so most of this I'm going to let you read on your own. I do want to point out and emphasize again that, that uh, no matter where you are, you have to have a proctored examination. Uh, and this requires making uh, an appointment with one of our testing centers. And as it, there's lots of information listed here in the syllabus about how to arrange uh, for uh, if you get an appointment to do a test. Uh, probably the only test that we'll be doing this semester will be the final exam. And uh, I'll set up due dates and all that kind of stuff uh, later on in the semester. But I do want you to know, uh, if, particularly if you're not on campus, not on one of our NOC campuses, if you are somewhere else in the country, we will have to find uh, a legitimate site for you to take uh, at least one in-person exam. Okay. And if you have any questions about that, again, just uh, send, me, uh, send me an email. The basic breakdown of the course, we will have three unit exams and a final exam. Uh, we'll also, most of the time we'll spend, and the, the essay, the, the unit exams will come at the end of the units, so we'll have the Romantics, uh, we'll have the Victorians, and then we'll have the Moderns. So that will make up the three unit exams, and there will be a final exam as well. Uh, mostly what you'll be doing in addition to reading is you'll also be taking quizzes online, you'll be posting reading responses uh, to your, primarily to your uh, reading journals. Uh, but there also will be, on occasion, some discussion postings. So you'll be interacting with each other in that way. As I said in my welcome video, the, uh, the reading journals, I think I said this, the reading journals are uh, on public view. So when you compose responses on the reading journals, other students in the class will be able to read those responses. Uh, but they, you can't comment on them. That's one of the limitations. You won't be able to comment on the other people's reading journals. But when I want you to interact and to uh, share notions uh, more uh, directive, uh, more direct, then we'll use the discussion postings. Uh, there's a statement of student support. This is particularly important if you have a disability. Uh, one of the things uh, that I do with these videos, and you'll notice this with the welcome video, is that uh, I cycle it through a YouTube channel, and uh, that adds uh, closed captioning. Uh, some of you may want to turn on closed captioning even if you don't necessarily need it, but uh, um, uh, if anyone has any difficulties uh, with documented disabilities and managing the course, again, please contact me, uh, but also you can contact, there are various numbers and people listed here uh, for the Tonkawa campus, the NOC campus, the Stillwater campus, and UC Ponca City. I'll let you read some of this again on your own. The course outline here is, is just very broad, uh, and as I indicate here, the specific reading and exam dates and all assignments and all that stuff are going to be posted elsewhere on Blackboard, and many of the assignments will actually be on the calendar, and the calendar link is right here. You can click on course calendar, and you'll see when reading assignments, journal assignments, or discussion board posts, or quizzes, uh, or exams are all due. Okay. Uh, that's about it for the syllabus. Uh, again, uh, go through it if you have any questions about it. Uh, make sure you contact me. I want to take a look at uh, the course materials and assignments. And the first thing on this, that you, the first assignments, the actual assignments you're going to have will be this week. I'm sorry, yeah, it will be this week. Uh, a couple of reading uh, journal responses uh, on the romantics. and. Sometime I want you to take a look at the guidelines for the reading journals responses, and it's not that complex, but it does sort of lay down the rules of the road. I don't need this. One second. Technical difficulties here. Here we have the guidelines for the reading journals, and again, they're not that elaborate, but I want you to—I want to make sure you understand uh, what the expectations are here. Um, 
I learn a lot from your responses as well. I like to read what uh, other people have to say about the works that I'm reading. Um, very often, uh, ideas that come from students will end up being incorporated in my classes. So uh, please take these seriously and try to be informative and uh, engaging in your responses. Uh, this also gives you some instructions about the reading journals. Clicking on reading journals, the, the link on the course menu, uh, you'll see the current reading journal assignments listed. And I'll go through this here in just a second. And you just hit create journal entry and then you compose your responses. Uh, make sure you're familiar with the assigned readings before offering analysis or reflection. Uh, in many cases, particularly early on, these poems, and we're going to be looking mostly at poetry um, uh, for the romantics, and we'll do a lot more reading in prose when we get to uh, the Victorians. Um, but it's very important that if you're able to do this with shorter works, to read them several times through. Um, you, you probably know this, but poetry is a kind of intense form of language, and it requires um, uh, attention to details. And uh, one of the ways to uh, become more confident when you're dealing with poetry is to make sure that you're reading the material not just one time through, but several times through, and even going back and reading sections of poems multiple times. Uh, it takes a little bit of effort uh, to work your way through uh, poetry. So um, it's very important that you take the time to become familiar with the readings that you're uh, uh, assigned before you start writing. Okay, And sometimes the process of writing the reading responses, and, the, and this is designed this way, is you, in writing about something, you also learn more about it. So uh, make sure you're familiar with the work. Um, and basically, I want to make sure that you demonstrate in your reading journal responses that you've actually read the work, uh, have uh, a good understanding of the work, and that that shows in the quality of your responses. Make sure you compose responses that meet the minimum word length, uh, and these will vary throughout the semester, but I'll always give you a word length, a minimum at least. Uh, often I'll give you a range. You can always write more. Uh, I don't penalize people for writing more than they, uh, than they have to but make sure you at least hit the minimum length. Uh, one little caution here, again, I've been teaching literature a very, very long time, uh, and I hear all kinds of what I would call dismissive responses. Uh, I don't expect you uh, to like everything that I ask you to read, uh, but I do expect you to treat them all with uh, uh, respect and the kind of dignity I think these works uh, uh, require. So please don't, um, offer comments like, I don't like this poem, uh, I thought this was really boring, uh, I'm completely baffled by this poem, I don't understand a bit of it. Uh, because the answer to not understanding is to go back and read it again and again and again, and you'll get better at it. Uh, learning how to read poetry is uh, uh, a skill. Uh, so uh, don't throw your hands up, uh, certainly not in your reading responses, and just sort of get up, give up, right with authority write with authority, write with confidence. And uh, lastly, I've already mentioned this, your reading journals are public, which means that everyone enrolled in the course will see them. So just be aware of, uh, that what you're saying will be uh, on public view, okay? The first reading journals, speaking of reading journals, if you look under course content, they're actually listed right here. And this is what they look like. There are two of them for the first week. Notice it says the visibility is public. Uh, so far, because the class hasn't started yet, uh, there are zero entries, but it's really a very simple process. You, you go on here, you click on the link, and in this case, I'm going to ask you to have, offer three short responses to three questions that have to do with Wordsworth's poem, Lines Written in Early Spring, which is listed on the, the schedule, which I'll show you here in just a uh, few minutes. Um, in order to respond to them, you need to do one of two things. You click on Create Journal Entry. You do have to give a title to it. Again, anything that's got the little asterisk means that it's required. What I suggest you do is that you title it Response To, and then whatever the title of the work is that I'm asking you to respond to. So this would be Response To Lines Written in Early Spring. Okay. There are two ways that you can do your reading journal responses. I'll tell you what my preferred way is, but I'm going to show you both ways. One is that you can simply type your responses into the text box that's provided. Okay, so you can just start typing here, and 
if you start typing and decide to come back and or decide you have to stop or go eat something or uh, do other parts of your life and come back later, you can save the entry as a draft and come back and revise it. Okay, when you're finished though, you know you're good to go, then you simply hit post entry. Okay, so you can enter responses directly into the text box. The other way of doing this though, and this is actually one I prefer, um, uh, it, it takes a, an additional step, but, but I think there are advantages to this that maybe you may not have uh, the same advantages of just typing in the text box. But that would simply be to uh, use your word processor, Microsoft Word, and type the response, save it on your computer, and then hit browse my computer and simply upload it or use the browse Dropbox. So either way, the, either way is fine with me. I probably prefer this way just because sometimes the formatting is much better uh, if you type the responses and, uh, and then upload them from the file. But either way is, uh, is perfectly fine. If, uh, if I need to tell you at some point, please don't use just the text box. Please make sure you use browse my computer. I will let you know. But there are, those are the two ways that you need to do uh, the responses. Cancel that. And again, uh, there are two of these set up for the first week. Here's the first one. And then there's another one on, in other words, where the poem, there was a boy. Okay. Uh, you're welcome to do both of these on the same day. Uh, they both have, uh, they have uh, specific due dates listed, so uh, make sure you get them done. Uh, uh, by the due dates, and the actual the due dates are actually listed on the calendar. If you look at course calendar, you won't be able to see this because let me try this real quick. You'll see these on your course calendar. Uh, some of this is another class, but this one, see the 21st, that's when the first one is due, and then the second response to the second poem is due on this day. Okay, so if you want to know what the due dates are for reading journals, uh, you can find them several places, but one of the way, one of the places you'll find them is on the course calendar, so they're posted there. Okay, and you'll see lots of assignments appearing on the calendar as the semester uh, goes on. Okay, one more thing that I want to talk a little bit about romanticism. Um, <clears throat> back under course materials and assignments, here is the uh, the five week first five week reading schedule. And I just want to show you this, and I showed you a, a, a show and tell on the uh, welcome video I did. But these are the reading assignments, and again, these are subject to change. Sometimes I'll decide to add something or a couple of things. Sometimes I may take something away. Uh, but I'll, when I modify this, I will certainly let you know. But basically, this is what we're going to be covering this semester, and it's what you need to make sure you keep up with. I divided this up into weeks rather than, say, days of the week. Obviously, we're online, so we're not meeting Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We're not meeting Tuesday, Thursday. We're not meeting just Monday. So it's all in a kind of package of weekly material. Uh, some of it's uh, the poetry or the original works you'll read, and uh, some of it will be introductory material that will help you better understand what you're reading. So, for instance, week one, we start on the 19th. We end on the 23rd. That's Monday through Friday, the first week of classes. I want you to read Characteristics of Romanticism from M.H. Abrams, and it's under Course Materials and Content, which is going to be over here. I'll show you that in just a second as well. I also would like you to watch uh, a video, the Romantics, the Nature video. And if you go to the web resources for the link, you'll see it. Let me just pop over there and you'll see. Uh, here's the welcome video. Okay, and the video I'm taking uh, to making today will also appear here. But I want you the first week to watch this video, The Romantics, Nature. It takes, uh, I think it's a, just a little short of an hour. Okay? Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about quite a bit uh, this semester, particularly with the Romantics, but we'll see this with the Victorians as well, is how important the concept and the notion of nature is to uh, uh, not only uh, poetry, but um, fiction and nonfiction and science, certainly, uh, as well. So. Um, one of the themes, particularly when it comes to the Romantics, and you'll see this with the poems that we read, nature is very important to the Romantics. Okay. How it's important is something that we're going to explore this semester. So anyway, this is where the video is. 
that I'd like you to watch the first week. Okay, go back to the schedule. Uh, and then there are two poems, and these are the two poems you'll have reading responses on. As I indicate, as I indicate here, uh, the reading journal assignments, quizzes, discussion posts, etc., are not actually listed on the schedule. You're going to find those again uh, on the calendar, uh, posted under reading journals. Um, so uh, just be aware that this is principally just the reading material or the material I want you to, uh, video material or uh, uh, course lectures that I want you to watch will be uh, listed. So this is the first week. We'll continue with Wordsworth on the second week. We're going to uh, read from uh, the preface to his lyrical ballads, and I'll uh, uh, probably have occasion to talk about lyrical ballads a little bit uh, over the next week or so, and how important that collection of work is to uh, not only British poetry, but uh, sort of poetry internationally. And then there are a couple of poems by Wordsworth here, probably his two most famous, and I would say uh, perhaps his two best poems. Lines written a few uh, miles above Tintern Abbey, sometimes just called Tintern Abbey for short, and Ode, Intimations of Immortality. So that's week two. So this is what you need to read for week two, and there will be corresponding reading journals or perhaps discussion posts for week two as well. Week three is a little bit short. Uh, I, uh, again, we don't meet on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But uh, it is a little shorter week, uh, so, uh, but I do have some poems here. We're going to spend that week on Coleridge. We may actually have to carry Coleridge over a little bit into week four. Sometimes that happens. That's what the subject to change means at the top of the schedule. Uh, Coleridge was a very prolific writer, but we're going to focus really on three of his poems. And again, here I have a, one of the other video, videos under web resources that I'd like you to watch sometime this week. Uh, probably at the beginning. I've listed these a little bit in the order in which I think you should uh, uh, do them. Uh, so reading this, then watching this video, and then reading the poems, because the videos often relate to what's going on in the poems that I'm asking you to read. Uh, the same thing goes for Coleridge. There's some stuff in this uh, video that you may find relevant to the poems I've assigned by Coleridge. In week four, we're going to tur uh, turn to Percy Bysshe Shelley. Uh, you know, the husband of Mary Shelley, the author of uh, Frankenstein. Uh, some prose, a defense of poetry. All of these uh, romantic poets are also a little bit uh, of a philosopher. So uh, they have a philosophy of poetry. So that's one of the things we're going to, going to pay attention to as well. And then you have the reading assignments again, the poems. And then week five, uh, we'll finish up um, with John Keats. So we're going to cover Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, and Keats, uh, four major British poets. Um, um, and I think by the time we're done with, with these four poets, you'll have a pretty good idea about what uh, British Romanticism uh, is about. And then we'll have a unit exam. And I'll talk more about exams uh, when we get a little bit closer. I will tell you that they will be uh, essay exams. So you'll have to write essays or an essay. Okay. All right, let me go back to uh, course materials and assignments. So here's the guidelines again for reading journals. Here's the schedule that we're going to follow. And what I'd like to do now, and I'm going to uh, stay on the screen a little bit, and I'll shift back to me here uh, at some point. But I do want to show you uh, a few other things here that you need to pay attention to. This is the handout characteristics of romanticism by M.H. Abrams, or taken from one of his books that I'd like you to go through. And he does a really good job of explaining uh, some of the philosophies, uh, the beliefs about what art should be uh, uh, that the Romantics describe, uh, both in their poetry as well as in their writings about poetry. So I want you to read this, Characteristics of Romanticism. And it's just sort of a list of characteristics. It's really important to try to understand what they're trying to do in their poetry in order to read it properly. So if you'll just read through this, and we'll probably come back to this at, at exam time. I will tell you one of the things I like to do is to ask you to apply information like you might see in Abrams' definition of romanticism or something that I say in class or something else I post to be able to apply, apply that information to some specific poems. For instance, if I were to ask you to choose one of Wordsworth's poems, 
what makes that a typical romantic poem. Okay, so that's why you need to know something about the literary movements in which these with which these writers are or in which these writers are participating and to some extent creating. Okay. I want to go to uh, one other handout here, uh, the timeline of British literature, and I want to talk a little bit about this. And this is again available for you to, to look at. Uh, literary movements um, uh, are often uh, a little fuzzy in terms of their beginnings and endings, but uh, this is actually derived, much of this is derived from that characteristics of romanticism, so it's a sort of in a nutshell what Abrams uh, uh, says about romanticism. But literary movements uh, are, are like uh, philosophical movements or other artistic movements. Um, somewhere along the line, one generation of writers and one group of writers will develop a philosophy of art, and it could be the visual arts, it could be uh, the poetical arts, it could be the philosophical arts, it could be politics. Uh, but they'll develop a, a sort of set of beliefs, and you'll see that set of beliefs reverberate through the culture. And when we can uh, draw these boundary lines between these different artistic and political and historical movements, social movements, then we'll sort of set that aside as a, a kind of a like-minded group. It's sort of the same thing we do with generations. You know, we talk about the greatest generation and millennials and uh, baby boomers. Uh, the same idea really applies to uh, literature. I'm going to jump back to the screen here, to the camera. The same basic idea applies to literature. That is, we can divide literary movements uh, up into certain categories and look for common characteristics of artists and philosophers and politicians and uh, uh, social activists and those sorts of things and group them all together. Beginning about 1660 and running up to 1789, and 1789 is a very important day for those of you who are, who are uh, or year, for those of you who are historically minded, that is essentially, that's the, the French Revolution. Uh, uh, and the Romantic movement, to a great extent, is an offshoot of the French Revolution. So one of the first things I want you to keep in mind, and, and keep this in mind throughout the semester, is that literature doesn't emerge out of a vacuum. Uh, literature reflects what's going on around the artists. And this is the same for the visual arts. Uh, so there's a romantic school in the visual arts. There's a neoclassical school in the visual arts. Uh, philosophy, politics, social sciences, that sort of thing. So uh, the Romantic period re really begins in 1789, and very often it's war that defines those different time periods. In American literature, for instance, American literature, if you take late American literature, for instance, uh, the time period will run up to um, um, about, uh, or early American will run up to about 1865. Why is that? Well. 1865, after the war, the culture changes, the country changes, the art changes. And writers being a part of the broader culture uh, will also change with it. So uh, the same thing happens in modernism, which we'll see we get later in the semester. Uh, after you get past the First World War, literature changes. That's what ushers in the modern period, is the horrors of the First World War. So 1914 and 1917. After that, literature changes. Same thing happens after the Second World War. So very often, literary time periods are demarcated by radical or uh, traumatic events in a broader culture. So the neoclassical period, sometimes called the Enlightenment period, uh, or the Age of Enlightenment, runs from 1660. This comes on the heels of the Renaissance and goes up to 1789, which is, again, the French Revolution. And then, at least in British literature, we see the Romantic period emerge, and that runs from about 1789. For the British, up to about 1820, uh, there's also a Romantic movement in American literature, and that runs uh, up through the 1860s. Uh, so again, the Civil War sort of brings it in to high Romanticism, at least as it occurs in uh, American literature. For British Romanticism, starts to slow down around 1820s, 1830s, uh, and then some other stuff comes along. 
I want to talk about just a contrast here because one of the ways to understand who the Romantics are is to understand what they're responding to and often responding against. And that would be the Enlightenment period and the Neoclassical period. Okay. Um, this is also the Neoclassical period, uh, uh, the 17th, early 18th century, late 18th century as well. This is also the period of the development of modern science. It's within this period that Sir Isaac Newton is working on his principles of gravity and laws of planetary motion and, and falling bodies and that sort of thing. So this is a, 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 a time, one of the reasons we call it the Age of Enlightenment is between 1660 and 1789, and this is, these are primary literary terms, uh, but in that period we also have the advent of what we would recognize as science, very systematic approach to the world. So the neoclassical period in the, the Age of Enlightenment is very much focused on reason and rationality. The ability of human beings to reason their way through complex problems. So you can understand why they would have a connection to science, right? Why is it called the neoclassical period? Well, uh, it's the Age of Enlightenment. I think that may be more suitable to thinking about uh, the, the, the developments in, in modern scientific notions. But the neoclassical period when it comes to literature, that term really means, as it suggests, neo, new, classical, classical. So it's the new classical period. We call it that because the authors and the artists, uh, we're going to focus mostly on authors, of course, the poets, the prose writers, the playwrights, they were mostly interested in um, uh, uh, classical work. So they, they admired the Greeks and they admired the Romans. So if you read through literary works of the neoclassical period, you'll have you'll see lots and lots of references to classical Greek and Roman art, architecture, and certainly literature. Lots of references to Homer, uh, uh, lots of references to uh, classical writers. The idea of being an artist, as a matter of fact, and being an author, being a writer during the classical period, part of what you had to demonstrate was that you understood the classics, that you had read the classics. So there's a kind of uh, demonstration on the part of the authors of their high education. That is that they were well educated and well instructed in classical literature. Which means that writing for the, the classes, the, cla the neoclassicists, to some extent was to demonstrate that you were a very well educated person and you could imitate, in many cases, those classical artists. Okay? So, uh, one of the things, and we'll talk about just in terms of contrast, the Romantics, on the other hand, had a very different focus. They weren't focused on, on reason, rationality, and intellect. They were much more focused on emotion and feeling. They're not interested, as a matter of fact, they're responding against this idea of rationalism and intellect. They believed that that was only the surface of things, that beneath the surface were much more powerful and potent forces at work. So, one thing I want you to think about as we're going through the Romantics, and you'll notice this, is the Romantics are much more interested in feelings and emotion, and much less interested in imitating classical forms, uh, much less in, in, interested in tradition. Uh, Neoclassical writers tended to distrust innovation. They were following the models, they were reproducing the old classical models. The Romantics embrace innovation. And one of the things that you'll see if you compare neoclassical poets to Romantic poets is that Romantic poets tend to produce poems that are less boxy and uniform on the page. They're much more interested in a little bit of experimentation about even what a poem should look like on a page. So for the neoclassical writers, uh, you learn to be a writer. You learn to be a writer through a process of study. And the quality of your work depended upon how well you studied and imitated the forms. For the Romantics, it was spontaneous. It was coming out of your own sense of self and out of your own experiences. It was about, as Wordsworth says, the spontaneous overflow of emotions. So a, a marked contrast between one generation of writers and then uh, the new generation of writers as we're going to treat them, that is the Romantics. One, the neoclassicists, 
very much interested in reason, rationality. Uh, the source of art is primarily through study, the romantics, emotion, spontaneity, and very much a focus on your own intuitive sense about what's important to write about. So I'm going to shift back over to the screen and go through just a couple of these. And again, this is all available to you through, uh, uh, through Blackboard. Uh, here it's all written down. Authors of the neoclassical age were strongly traditional and distrusted innovation, had a great respect for classical writers. If I scroll down here, you can see the contrast. The Romantics offers favored innovation over tradition without regard for classical models. Wordsworth announced that poetry should deal with common life in a selection of language really used by men. Now I want you to think about this. Why might a, a writer following on the heels of, of the overthrow of the monarchy, uh, the French Revolution, and within a decade of the American Revolution, why might poets be much more concerned about how real people really talk? Uh, romanticism and the development of romantic ideas really goes hand in hand also with the development of democratic ideas and ideals. That is that each individual has something to contribute no matter what their class, no matter what their status of learning. So that's why you have Wordsworth He's not, he's not interested in what the old classical Roman and Greek poets had to say. He wants to know what the guy down the lane has to say. And he wants him to say it the way he wants to say it. Uh, uh, it's a little more artificial than that. You can see the, the turn here. Strongly traditional, distrust of innovation for the neoclassicists. A favoring of innovation over tradition without regard for classical models. Okay? The other thing... Or one other thing I want to point out here is that um, the neoclassicists thought that art was for aesthetic pleasure and learning. Again, this was a, uh, you want to demonstrate that you were well versed in the classics before you would ever write a poem if you're a good neoclassical writer. But for the romantics, because they're not interested in, in rationality and reason, the romantics are much more interested in the interior life, not to reflect the exterior, but to reflect the interior. So that art, and particularly poetry, is not a mirror, it's not an imitation of life, but it's really a kind of record of the experience of being alive. That's a good way to think about the Romantics. They, they want to record the experience of being alive. And that experience is enriched by poetry. And as a matter of fact, what poetry is supposed to do is to take those experiences, very often common experiences, walking around the meadow, sitting under a bush, going into the woods, climbing a mountaintop, uh, engaging in daily work. Part of what the Romantics wanted to do was to take those common experiences and elevate them through poetry, to make them important. That's a very different approach to poetry than what we find with the neoclassical writer. So spontaneity, not careful reasoning and rationality, not applying a kind of systematic scientific approach to the composition of a poem, but this kind of spontaneous overflow, as Wordsworth describes it, in order to produce art. One very important component, and the neoclassicists were very interested in nature as well, uh, but for the Romantics, nature is a persistent subject of poetry. Persist, persistent subject of poetry. But it's not simply describing nature. What they describe is the interaction between the poet and nature, and a kind of uh, passing between the two of various influences. Okay, so one of the things you're gonna see with romantics, there's a, there's a term uh, called the romantic ego, or the egotistical sublime is sometimes called. But romantic poets, talk about themselves. I went to the woods, and I thought this, and I felt this, and I witnessed this, and I experienced this. You can also see why, again, why Romanticism links so perfectly well with the development of democracy, which also uh, uh, focuses a great deal on the importance of the individual. The individual in relationship to the community, yes, but it's the individual, and individual perceptions, and individual liberties, 
individual rights, those are the hallmarks of democracy. We see those same elements reflected in romantic poetry. So the focus in romanticism is yes on nature, but it's also very much upon the human condition. It's also very much, and I'm going to skip down to this last one here, unlike ne neoclassical poetry that was primarily about other people, romantic poetry is often about the poet. And the poet, and you'll see this in the poems that we read, is often a kind of solitary figure. Sitting by himself, as Wordsworth does, uh, in a grove of trees and contemplating nature. So romantic poetry is very much about the poet. Not so much the poet as a conduit of classical learning, but about that particular poet in that particular situation. The other thing that's very important to keep in mind, and just for the sake of contrast, and, and with this I'll uh, close my little lecture today. The other thing that's very important to keep in mind in terms of contrasting the neoclassical or the Enlightenment period poets artists, philosophers, is that while neoclassicism, and again you have to remember this is, the, this is the time in which science is really becoming a powerful force, and this is going to carry over well to the Victorian period, uh, we're very much interested and very much concerned about the power of reason and rationality, the romantics sort of turn around and say, no, that's not what makes life interesting. What makes life interesting is the imagination. So for the romantics, the real power that exists within the human being, the human psyche, is not so much reason and rationality, but this transformative power of the imagination. To be able to take the common language of men, as Wordsworth says he does, or common activities, they often like to focus on uh, common labors like spinning and weaving and farming and that sort of thing. How do you elevate that to something worth writing a poem about? You do it through the potent power of the romantic imagination. So the contrast here, in a very simple way, is that the earlier the generation that precedes the romantics were very much concerned about reason, rationality, order, uh, civilization, uh, patterns, uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. Whereas the romantics were much more interested in the power of the imagination, power of innovation and the power of individual creative powers. Okay, I hope that uh, some of that will help you as you read through Wordsworth and Coleridge and Shelley and Keats just to keep these, these, these basic ideas about what it means to be a romantic artist uh, in and of themselves as well as in contrast to the previous generation. They saw themselves very, very deliberately as revolutionaries, just as uh, those who stormed the Bastille uh, and kicked off the French Revolution in 1789 saw themselves as political revolutionaries. The Romantics saw themselves as poetical and artistic revolutionaries. They had a very different idea about what it meant to be an artist. And they embed this in their composition of their works. The first couple of poems that we're going to be looking at here, as you'll see, focus very much on the relationship between the poet or some figure the poet creates and presents us in the poem, a character in a poem, and nature. Okay? And we're going to see that as a constant theme. But certainly in the first two poems of Wordsworth that, I, Wordsworth that I've asked you to read, uh, you're going to see how important nature is. But part of the importance is to see the contrast between uh, nature and um, humanity. And one of the other characteristics, and we'll talk more about this as we move through the semester, that is typical of romantics, is there's this sense that humanity has lost something along the way that we've lost our innocence, that we are no longer able to respond to nature with a kind of freshness, say, of, a, of a child, how a child might respond to a beautiful scene. Um, uh, that something has happened to humanity that the romantic poets need to try to recover. And part of what they try to recover, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes they admit uh, failing at this, is this connection back to nature. This is one of the first back-to-nature movements, as a matter of fact. Uh, in addition to 
the development of science, we're also moving into the, into the age of industrialization, greater and greater concentration of people in larger cities. So part of what the Romantics are responding to is this kind of burgeoning uh, a building of what will, will fully flower in the next century, which is industrialization, which is seen as yet one more component that alienates us from nature. Uh, uh, and you'll see some of this in the videos that I've asked you to watch as well. This adherence to clocks, for instance. You know, the Romantics sort of mourning the idea that we, uh, we all live our lives now by clocks, have to be somewhere at a particular time, perform a certain task. Uh, so Romanticism has a quality of escapism from this sort of encroaching industrial and what will turn out to be modern life. Okay, I'm going to stop today. That's a lot more than uh, you probably need to uh, absorb. But again, if you will, uh, uh, make sure you go through the schedule. Make sure uh, uh, the first week you complete those reading journal assignments. Uh, make sure you read the material that I want you to read on uh, the contents page. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, and uh, I'd be glad to respond as best I can. You all have a really good first week, and I will see you again on, uh, in a couple of days. Thank you.